Hello, everyone. Welcome to the National Wildlife Federation's All Access. My name is naturalist David Mizajewski, and today we're going to be talking about creepy critters. We're going to have a little fun with this one, a little bit uh, less serious than some of our other All Accesses, which have really focused on declining species and and you know some of the conservation work we're, that we're doing to protect those species, and focus a little bit more on learning a little bit about animals that might actually scare us. But hopefully at the end of this, you'll have gained a little bit of knowledge and knowledge is power and it can help us overcome fear. Before we dive in, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have any connectivity issues, um, you can sign back into the original link that we sent you in your confirmation emails and reminders. You can also listen by conference call by dialing the number that's on your screen. I'll read it for you, 646-558. 8656. If you have a pen handy, you might want to write that down. Um, and once you call in, you can enter the code that's also on your screen. Um, and also, you can see at the very bottom there, if you still are having issues, you can give our team a call and we'll do our best to help you out and, and get connected. I'll leave this screen up just for one second. Um, I am actually calling in from uh, vacation. I'm up in Maine right now. And so I myself have been having a little bit of connectivity issues. We're keeping our fingers crossed that my internet connection stays strong. Um, if I happen to cut out, just, you know, we appreciate your patience. I will call right back in. We've got some backup plans in case the worst happens, but, you know, I'm going to knock on wood here and hope that that doesn't happen. Okay. So um, if you have questions, you can submit them during the presentation using the Q&A icon that's at the bottom of your screen. So if you take a look down there, you'll see the little Q&A question and answer. You can submit questions there. Um, if you don't see it, you might need to hover your mouse over the screen um, or maybe even tap, with, tap the screen with your finger, depending on what device you're on. Um, but you can submit questions that way. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end to you know, take some of those questions. If I don't get to your questions, if I don't answer them during the presentation or we don't get to them at the end, we will do our best to follow up with you via email um, and get you some answers. So without further ado, let's dive in. So again, my name is naturalist David Mizajewski. Um, I've been with the Federation for just a little bit over 20 years now, which kind of blows my mind every time I say it. But um, uh, my job as a naturalist is to help interpret the natural world and share my knowledge of it with everybody out there and hopefully do that in a way that not only educates but inspires folks through knowledge to want to get involved in wildlife conservation with the National Wildlife Federation. So you all know this because you are tremendous supporters without whom we couldn't do all the amazing work that we do at the National Wildlife Federation, but this is our mission, uniting all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrive in a rapidly changing world. And it's no surprise that we human beings are the major source of that rapid change. And you know, the National Wildlife Federation is doing work in many, many different ways to protect wildlife, like the bald eagle here, um, and, and wildlife species all around North America and to a degree around the world as well. So as I mentioned, today we're gonna to be talking about what we call kind of tongue in cheek, creepy critters. These are animals that tend to get a bad rap that people tend to be afraid of. And I found this, this quote, I don't know who Philip Yancey is, but I found this online. And it kind of is a great summation of what I'm trying to, trying to achieve here today. By sharing information about these animals, I'm hoping that that knowledge can dissolve fear as light destroys darkness. Because if we are hating wild animals and killing wildlife and trying to eliminate other species because we're afraid of them, I don't think that's a really good reason. Um, certainly there might be some legitimate reasons to have a natural healthy fear of certain wild animals, but we shouldn't let that fear drive us to wipe those other species out. Usually we can coexist with almost every wildlife species. Sometimes it does require a little bit of behavior change on our part, but this is the spirit in which this talk is, is, is kind of being given today. I'm hoping that knowledge can help you overcome any fears that you might have of some of these animals and help you live a little bit more in harmony with them. And really, this is kind of what it boils down to when it comes to living conflict free with wildlife. And this is what we teach kids when we're, you know, we're talking to wildlife to, to them and to, you know, the next generation. And it's just this, if you don't try to pick up, touch, handle, hug, snuggle, put in your pocket or otherwise mess with a wild animal, your chances of being 
bitten, stung, scratched, or otherwise injured by that animal are pretty much zero, right? It's just common sense. So the idea here is that, you know, again, sometimes there is a legitimate reason to have a fear of wild animals. They can sometimes hurt us. But if you practice that golden rule and you never try to approach them and you respect them rather than fear them, almost always you're not going to be in any real danger. So keep that in mind as we are going through all of these really, really cool wild animals. All right, let's start with the first group, bees and wasps. Now, bees are probably the first wild animal that we're taught to fear as children. And, you know, it's legitimate. Bees can sting and it hurts. <laughs> Some of us are allergic to them. And so there's a legitimate reason, you know, why we might have a fear of these insects. But bees are incredibly important. They provide a just absolutely critical ecosystem service. And that is that they are pollinators. So what's pollination? Pollination is the way that plants actually reproduce. So plants can't move around. So many plant species have evolved these showy blooms that draw in animal pollinators, most notably the bees. And the bees come and they want to get rewarded with some nectar, which is sugar water. It's what they eat and what they feed their babies. They also gather some pollen, which is full of protein. Um, but in doing so, they get their bodies covered in that pollen, which is actually the reproductive um, parts of the, the information of, of the plant. It's the male reproductive part. And the bee gets covered in that. And when she flies to the next flower, some of it rubs off on that next flower and fertilizes it. And so that is how plants who can't pick up and move to find a mate the way that wild animals can, that's how they actually reproduce. Now, there are some plants that reproduce not using animals to move their pollen, but the wind. But you know, most flowering plants, 80, 90% of them, rely on animals to pollinate them. And most, again, notably, it's the bees. There are 20,000 bee species on this planet. And right here in America, in North America, we've got almost 4,000. So they're a really, really diverse group of animals and they're providing this pollination service, which without which wild plant communities could not reproduce. So imagine a world where plants stopped being able to form seeds and, and, and perpetuate their species all the wild animals out there would perish as well because wildlife need plants. They're the foundation of the food web um, and they provide all the habitat. And so bees are really, really, really important when it comes to just life as we know it on this planet. And that's pretty much the point that I was just making that pollinators are essential for functioning ecosystems. I'll note too that they're essential for our food production, our agriculture, and therefore our economy. Most of the like one in one in three bites of food that we eat is actually the result of pollination by animals, again, mostly bees. So they're really important for our crops as well. But here's the thing. Everything you think you know about bees is wrong. Um, <laughs> I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but hopefully again, I'm going to surprise you with some of these fun facts. And the reason I say that is because most of what we know about bees is based on this species. This is the European honeybee. Really, really great species of bee. Really, really important for our agriculture. This is the bee species that does the majority of the pollination of our crops. Um, however, here in North America, this is not a native species that was actually brought over by European colonists specifically for those agriculture services. So the pollination services of crops, the production of honey as a food source, um, beeswax, you know, which is also a, a good commodity, but you really can't think of them as wildlife here in North America. They're kind of like the equivalent of what like a cow is to a bison. You know, a honeybee, a domesticated honeybee is to a wild native bee. So again, in North America, we've got almost 4,000 species of wild native bees here. That doesn't count the honeybee. And the honeybee happens to be the exception to most of the rules in the bee world. That's why if all you know is about the honeybee, you probably don't know a lot about most bee species on this planet. So let's walk through some of that real quick. Number one, not all bees are black and yellow. You know, that's again, as kids, we learn what it's a bee, it's got black stripes, black and yellow stripes. And, you know, we color them and we draw them and it's really cute. But, you know, a lot of bees do have black and yellow and they do have stripes, but a lot of them don't. These are all bees that you're looking at right here. 
Many of them are metallic greens and blues and golds and blacks. Some of them are even red. So, you know, you probably have seen some of these bees flying around and never knew that they were a bee because you didn't know that bees couldn't be just black and yellow. The other thing about bees is that bees don't form hives. I'll repeat that, bees don't form hives, at least not the majority of them. So of the 20,000 bee species on the planet, we've got roughly 90% of them are, are solitary bees. That means that they are not social, they don't form hives. Only about you know, roughly 10% or so of the bee species that exist are social and form hives. Those would be the honeybees, the bumblebees, but again, the majority of the bees don't form hives. It's individual single female bees who mate and then they lay their eggs in a tunnel either in the ground like this species or a tunnel in like dead or dying wood or hollowed out plant stems and things like that. And these bees, because they don't live socially, they actually just lay their eggs, they provision that egg with a little ball of nectar and pollen and then they fly on their way. They don't care for them. So therefore they don't have to make honey and they don't have anything to protect like a social bee. So therefore they are much less likely to want to sting you because stings pretty much only happen in defense of a hive or if the bee feels like it's an imminent danger. And by the way, only female bees can sting. The stinger is a modified ovipositor, which is the organ or the structure that, um, that insects use to lay eggs. So therefore, Males don't lay eggs and they don't have an ovipositor, so they can't sting. So bees aren't black and yellow. Bees don't form hives. They don't make honey, at least not most species. And the other thing that we think about bees is that, you know, they love flowers. They'll go out and they'll gather nectar and pollen from any flower. But the reality is, is we're learning some maybe 25 to 30 percent of our wild native bees are what we call pollen specialists. So you might be familiar with how butterflies and moths can only lay their eggs on certain plants that their caterpillars eat. We call them host plants. And without those host plants, the butterflies can't continue their reproductive cycle. Same thing with these bees. They can only gather the pollen from certain species of native plants to feed their babies. And so without the native plants present, those bee species disappear. This happens to be a squash bee. North American native bee that evolved with wild squash plants, which are also native here. And it's really cool. The males actually at night go into the squash blossom. And if you've ever grown squash or zucchini, you know that at night those flowers close up. So the male bees climb in there, the flower closes on them, they have a nice little safe place to sleep overnight. And then in the morning, the flower opens up and they go about their business trying to find a mate. Really cool stuff. Not something you should be afraid of. Actually, those males can't sting. So I think you probably know this, but bee populations are declining. The honeybee is facing certain issues in, um, you know, in managed hives, but a lot of our wild native bees are disappearing as well. The rusty patched bumblebee used to be super common across a lot of the Northeast and Midwest is now on the endangered species list. Um, and it's because of pesticide use, disease, invasive species, climate change, and just general habitat loss. And you know, this is kind of morbidly funny but it's kind of true. Um, again, bees, even though they can sting us and it can hurt and a lot of us are afraid of them, um, we really need to respect them and protect them. And if we don't, this, you know, this, this kind of morbid cartoon is, is really the reality. Life on this planet could not exist as we know it without bees. So let's talk about wasps for a second, which is another kind of insect that can sting us and elicits a lot of fear. Now wasps actually are the progenitors of bees. Bees evolved from wasps. And that's important because bees you can kind of think of as the, you know, the vegetarian version of wasps. And so even though again, wasps can sting the females, um, they are super, super beneficial animals to have around because unlike their bee descendants, most wasp species are carnivorous. That means that they actually feed on other insects including many species that are pests. So this is a, um, a hornworm. If you've ever grown tomatoes, you know these guys can do a number on them. But this particular caterpillar is covered in those little white cocoons of braconid wasps. Now, if you've ever seen the movie Alien, and again, it's sort of Halloween season, so maybe you're you know, watching all of your old classic favorite horror films right now. I know I am. Um, the movie Alien is kind of the, the idea of that alien creature is kind of based on this concept. The eggs get laid into a host, the eggs hatch, and they actually feed on the host from the inside out and then emerge as the adults by busting through the skin. It's pretty gruesome, but it's an effective way at controlling a lot of insect pests and wasps do this. 
they're also predatory. Um, this is a an eastern cicada killer wasp, pretty big. You know, they get to be you know over an inch long, and you can see it's got its cicada prey here. So a, a lot of wasp species are out there hunting actively for insects, not just being a, a parasite and stinging them to paralyze them, and then they bring them back and provision their young with them. So again, pretty gruesome, but um, not something that wasps can do to people. And in doing so, they're providing, again, this really important ecological service of keeping the numbers of other insect species under control. So I mentioned this is an Eastern cicada killer wasp, pretty big species. It is not a murder hornet. This is the, again, murder hornet is not the name that we prefer because it, it basically is a name that is designed to make you afraid. Um, and the reality is, is that this is a species native to Asia. It's called the giant hornet. Um, they are big. They can be like two inches long. They have, you know, big jaws and they can sting and it packs a wallop and all of those things. But um, they made the news this past spring because they were found in certain spots up in British Columbia and in Washington state. Um, we're still tracking them and trying to wipe out those few colonies that have been found. So this species doesn't become a established here in North America where its main the main problem is that it actually could prey on honeybee hives. And that's a problem for agriculture because it's just another thing that the commercial honeybee industry would have to deal with when it comes to keeping their hives healthy so they can pollinate our crops. Um, but yeah, if you've seen these, if you've seen a large, large wasp or hornet of any kind and you're not in those very specific spots in the Pacific Northwest, it's almost certainly, again, a cicada killer or even a European hornet, which has been established here in North America. That's pretty big too, but not, not as big as the, the Asian giant hornet. So in addition to being pest predators and parasites, wasps are also pollinators. Many species visit flowers, like this great golden digger wasp, a really cool species found all across North America. And so you might see them, you know, buzzing around your flowers. And, you know, when wasps and bees are doing that, they're not being defensive. So you really don't have anything to worry about. I mean, I all the time am milling about in my perennial beds and my wildflower gardens, pruning and planting, surrounded by bees and wasps all the time. And I've never been stung in that scenario. And I'm actually allergic to wasps. I have to carry an EpiPen and I don't even worry about it. So another fun little cartoon that I found online, you might've seen other versions of this that call wasps names that I won't repeat, but um, this is more accurate. You know, they're, they're both important groups of insects. They both provide really important ecological services. And again, if we don't try to, you know, swat them or crush them or go after them or panic when we're around them, then chances are you're gonna be just fine. You're not gonna have any issues with bees or wasps. All right, let's move on to our next group of animals, spiders. Now, spiders are really, really neat as well. They, of course, are arachnids. They're not insects. And globally, we've actually got, um, I think it's something like 50,000 species of spiders. Here in the US, there's roughly 3000 species. So there's a lot of spiders out there and they come in all different kinds. Um, we do have some potentially dangerous spiders here. We've got black widows, we've got brown recluses, and there's also a, an introduced species called the hobo spider. And I just threw up some maps here. I just wanna get this out of the way quickly. I, again, don't think we need to be afraid of spiders, but I wanted to recognize that there are a few species whose venom you know, could be potentially painful or you know, dangerous to humans. And there's a few different species of black widow. Um, the yellow area there um, on that one map is where the brown recluse is. So if you don't live in that area, you can't have gotten, you you know, you wouldn't have seen a, a brown recluse. We get reports of brown recluses from every state. People are constantly being bitten by them, but usually it's something that's not even a spider bite. It's a misdiagnosis. So I just wanted to throw that up there again, because knowledge is power. And, you know, if you want to learn to identify any potentially dangerous species, no matter where you live. So I wanted to share this, but most of our, oh, wait, before I get it onto that, wanted to share also this, is a daddy long legs and it is not a spider. It is an arachnid. It's kind of a spider cousin, but it's got a different kind of body shape than actual true spiders. And you might've heard the myth that these are the most venomous spider out there. And so again, not only are they not spiders, but that's not true either. And so you don't have anything to worry about from these really cool arachnids. But yeah, most of our spiders 
are completely harmless. And, you know, whether it's orb weavers that weave the big webs or wolf spiders that are running along on the ground or cute little jumping spiders hopping among your flowers looking for prey, they're all pretty fascinating if you pay attention to them a little bit. And yes, they got these long legs and they're kind of prickly and everything. But, um, you know, again, as long as you don't try to pick them up or touch them and you're aware of your surroundings, you know, if you're digging in the brush or the logs where some of these spiders like to, you know, hang out, then you really don't have any issues with them. This is one of my favorite species. It's the Argiope garden spider. And these are big spiders, you know, they can get their bodies can get to be, you know, pretty big like that, the big females, and they do weave these big, these big webs. And yes, I will totally give you that it's kind of creepy when you're walking through your yard or the trail and you get covered in a spider web, but you know, it's not going to hurt you. Um, and check out the pattern that this spider has woven into her web. Can you see that zigzag? That is actually a deliberate behavior that these spiders do. And it's thought that they do it so that, you know, most of the, the, the web is pretty thin and designed that to be that you can't see it so that insects will actually fly into the web and get caught and be a meal. That though means that sometimes bigger animals like us or birds or mammals might also crash through the web. And that's a lot of effort on the part of that female spider. So they weave these zigzags in and it's thought that that is meant to be a visual cue to larger animals that the web is there. I mean, talk about a real life Charlotte's web, right? I mean, yes, they're not writing words in the web, but they are putting a symbol there, if you will, that we actually, other species can interpret, which is fascinating, right? Really, really fascinating. So, and you know, the big thing about spiders, just like with wasps, is that Every species of spider is carnivorous. Spiders are out there taking care of the excess populations of insects and other creepy crawlies, many of which could actually be pests. So they provide a really, really, really important service for us by keeping insects and, and other creepy crawlies kind of, again, their populations under control. You know, if it's for me, I always say I would much rather have a spider web in my, in my yard or on my patio than a bunch of mosquitoes or biting flies or things like that, right? So putting things in perspective, while you might be afraid of spiders, you wanna keep them around because they're really important. So just sharing some other kinds of spiders. This is one of the crab spiders. These spiders have this fascinating behavior of hanging out in flowers. And as you can see by this one, oftentimes they're very camouflaged. Um, this is a, a species that hangs out in goldenrod and goldenrods bloom yellow and they sit there and they have their arms open like the one in the picture and when a another insect you know sometimes it's a bee or a butterfly comes up to nectar at that that plant those arms kind of lock and then it bites with its two venomous fangs and so and this is another thing too um, I forgot to mention at the top is that all spiders have venom so you know, even you hear some of oh, the venomous spiders, they're dangerous. All spiders have venom. The black widow, the brown recluse, the hobo, those are species that have venom that, you know, could be potentially harmful to people. The rest of them, really not so much. Um, there are some species that, you know, might feel kind of like a bee sting. I've heard some, you know, wolf spiders, certain species can, can you know, have a kind of a painful bite when they do bite, which is incredibly rare. But for the most part, again, if you get bitten by a spider, it's really not a big deal. So this is the crab spider hanging out in a, in a flower. This is a wolf spider. And yes, those are all little babies on her back. And I know that might be a little squicky for you, but I chose to share this because spiders make good moms, at least some species. They're, and all of those little babies are gonna hang out on the mom's back and she's gonna keep them safe so that they can grow into big adult spiders that are gonna, again, help keep ground dwelling insects, you know, including things like roaches and ants and, you know, things that, you know, that might actually end up being true pests in and around your home under control. So they're good moms. And I don't know about you, but I love jumping spiders. They are the cutest little things and I don't know what it is about them. Um, they're just almost like living cartoons. And so I just think they're the cutest things ever. You might not agree, and I might not ever convince you that spiders are cute, but I just think this little, little spider here is just adorable. So I'm hoping I'll convert some of you guys into thinking spiders are cute. 
And, you know, there's just something magical, I think, about spiders and their webs. Um, you know, all spiders have the ability to, to spin silk, but not all spiders do spin webs. Again, the orb weavers that I mentioned earlier will spin webs. Other spiders are using that silk for other things. So, you know, wolf spiders or some of the tarantulas will use it to spin kind of like a little shelter on the ground. Um, spiders also use their silk as a mode of transportation. Again, think back to Charlotte's Web. If you've ever read that book or seen the movie, at the end when the babies hatch, those spiders spin out a little piece of silk which catches in the wind. And they're so tiny, the wind will carry them until they land, they hit something and that silk sticks on a branch or something. And that's where that spider will set up shop. So it's pretty fascinating um, behavior. And, um, and actually I wanna correct myself. Not all spiders are venomous. Now that I say that, there is actually one or maybe two families of spiders that don't have venom that they inject with their fangs. Instead, they catch their prey in their webs and they basically vomit up digestive juices all over it and the prey dissolves and then they just suck it up. So I'm probably not doing myself any favors trying to convince you not to be grossed out by spiders by telling you that, but um, just wanted to be accurate there, I forgot that. So anyway, spider webs are magical. They're one of the most beautiful things I think in nature when they're covered in, in, in dew like this. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I just think it would be a sad place, this world, if we didn't have things like spider webs. I do, uh, we did get one question that I wanna answer while I'm talking here too, and that is about spider webs in fall. Like, why do we see so many more spider webs in fall? It's just because of the spider's life cycle. The spiders hatch in the spring, the egg case is oftentimes over winter, um, the babies hatch in the spring, and it takes them a while to grow big enough to begin you know, spinning webs and, and to start being conspicuous. And usually by this time of year, you know, kind of that's, there's just a lot of adult spiders out there that are spinning webs and mating. And it's just, you know, part and parcel of the time of year. And maybe that's why we associate them with Halloween. All right, let's dive into bats. Again, Halloween, I think probably bats more than anything are the group of wildlife that we associate with, a, with the, that holiday. So let's talk a, a few quick stats about bats. So there's about 1400 species of bats. They're one of the most diverse groups of mammals on the planet. You know, think about it, you know, how many wild cat species are there? A few dozen. You know, how many bear species are there? Seven. Um, how many bat species are there? 1400. It's pretty phenomenal to think how diversified this one particular group of mammals has become. They're also the only truly flying mammals on the planet. We have things like flying squirrels and sugar gliders and flying lemurs. These all glide with a flap of skin between their front and back legs, which is called a patagium, they're not actual wings. So bats are the only truly flying mammals. There's you know, more species of them than pretty much any other group of mammal. Um, here in the US, we've got about 40, 45 to 47 species that are considered found in the US. So like bees and wasps and like spiders, bats on the whole are hugely beneficial to people. And unlike those other two groups of wildlife, the potential of harming a person is very, 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 very slim. So bats mostly are out there doing really good work acting as pest predators um, and also as pollinators. Now, I couldn't do this presentation without acknowledging that vampire bats are real. This is one of them. There's actually three species of them. None of them are found in the US. Um, I think one species ranges up into, into Mexico. They're sort of sat found in Central and South America and in sort of Southern North America. And they mostly are feeding on um, ungulates, hoofed mammals. Um, they oftentimes will feed on domesticated cows. Have they ever bitten a person before? Yes, it's happened. But you know, those people don't turn into vampires. That's a myth, I think you all know that. But um, you know, even that, even the adaptation, the, the evolution for certain bat species to evolve to eat blood as, their, as a main food source is pretty phenomenal if you think about it. And these bats actually have almost like a, um, an anesthetic in their saliva so that when they bite their prey, it kind of goes numb and they can drink up the blood as it comes out. It's pretty fascinating. But most of the bats that we have in North America are insect eaters and I mentioned some of them are pollinators. We're gonna talk about that in a second. But um, 
you know, like I said, bats are, are really cool. Their, their front limbs are their wings. So you can see the digits, their fingers and their little thumb, and they have these skin flaps between them that has formed, that, that you know, sort of create the wings. Um, and I think, again, in a certain way, they can be pretty cute. Some of them have these really monster faces, but a lot of them actually are, are, are kind of cute and cuddly looking. So this is one of our most common species. This is the little brown bat found pretty much across North America. These bats are, you, you know, we've all heard about bats as a way to help kind of control mosquitoes. And sometimes that gets a little bit overblown, but the most recent research that I'm aware of has actually shown that little brown bats do indeed include mosquitoes as a significant portion of their diet. Now, are they gonna eliminate every last mosquito out there? No, but it certainly can't hurt to have a good healthy bat population in your neighborhood or maybe even in your yard if you put up something like a bat house. So little brown bats are really great. Big brown bats are another common species. These are also insect eaters. They also will eat some mosquitoes, but maybe not as much as the little brown bat. These bats are feeding more on things like moths and beetles that fly at night. And many of the species of insect that bats feed on are big agricultural pests. So again, they are providing a really important ecological service to us that impacts our agriculture, which therefore impacts our health and our food systems and our economy. So bats are really, really important for all of that. Um, this is a Mexican free-tailed bat. If any of you have ever been um, down to Austin, Texas, this is the species of bat that live under the bridge that come out in the thousands at nighttime in the summer. Really, really incredible natural phenomenon that we have right here in our own country um, that we can go and observe when the pandemic is over um, and everybody's traveling again, but just really, really, amazing behaviors. And just think of all that biomass. Think of how many insects those thousands of bats are eating every single night, right? It's really, really significant, their impact that they have on the ecosystem and therefore on us. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is a pallid bat. If you live out west in California and places um, in sort of desert areas, you might have seen this bat species. They're kind of blonde, you know, we associate blondes with California for some reason, Hollywood and all that. So I think it's fitting. But this bat is pretty neat because most bat species really can't take off from the ground. Most of our bat species um, kind of, they, they, they're, they're much more arboreal. So they like to kind of drop out of a tree branch or off of a cliff or something and they spread their wings and they flap away. This species, the pallid bat, actively hunts on the ground. It's pretty actually crazy to watch. So what they do is they'll use their echolocation, they'll, their sonar, which most of the insect eating bats use, where they put out sound, little tiny chirps that are barely audible to humans. They bounce off things and the bat can actually perceive what's around it just by, by doing that. And by the way, bats are not blind. You can see very clearly that they have eyes, um, but they use this echolocation and their ears, which is why so many of these insect eating bats have those massive ears. Um, to be able to find their prey. But they hunt things like scorpions. And I don't know, I think most people would prefer to have bats flying around in the air than scorpions scurrying around under their feet, right? So they eat scorpions and centipedes and other night active insects and other arthropods. And so they will find them on the ground and they will land and they kind of, you know, their skin flaps fold and they run on the ground like a little miniature wolf or, you know, or, or, or big cat or something like that. It's really, really incredible. So that's a pallid bat. This is one of my favorites. This is the Eastern red bat, a species that's really, really declining. And you can see where it gets its name. It's got red fur. And look at that face. I mean, it's kind of so, so homely, you just can't help but love it. Now, red bats are really neat because they are a species of bat that hibernates, which many bat species do. But when the temperatures get really cold, they're normally hibernating under you know, tree, old tree bark and dead and dying trees or inside tree cavities and things like that. But if it gets really, really cold, they'll go down to the ground and they will bury themselves in the leaf litter. So at this time of year, one of our, our big messages at the National Wildlife Federation is to try to tell people to try to keep as many of your fall leaves on the ground where they are because many, many species of wildlife use them as habitat frogs and toads and salamanders, all sorts of insects, even butterflies and moths over winter as pupa or caterpillars in the leaf litter. And now you know that one of our bat species does as well, the red bat, really neat. 
Okay, so most of our bat species, most of the 47 species are feed on insects and they, again, provide a really important ecological service in doing so. But we also have in North America, two bat species that are nectar feeders. And it's the Mexican long-tongued and the lesser long-nosed bat. And these are largely species that are found in Mexico and South, but they do sometimes range up into the desert Southwest, New Mexico and Arizona. So if you live in those states, you might be lucky enough to actually see these bats come by. And these nectar eating bats are also in the wild actually provide a significant service to us because they pollinate mostly things like cacti and other succulents and things like that, including agave. And it is from agave that we get tequila. So next time you're enjoying your margarita, you can thank a bat for it because without the bat pollination of agave, those plants couldn't exist and we wouldn't have that very popular beverage. And normally we tell people, you know, don't feed mammals in your backyard. You know, it's okay to put out a few bird feeders. This is the exception that I make. So if you do live in Arizona or New Mexico, you might just get lucky enough to have one of our nectar feeding bats show up at your hummingbird nectar feeder. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so let's move on to our last group of animals. Actually, I have two more and I'm gonna zip through both of these because I wanna make sure we have time for questions. Snakes, so many people are afraid of snakes. And again, not, not without reason, there are venomous species of snakes that can be harmful to us. And you know, we probably have an innate fear of things like snakes just back through our evolutionary history, just because again, they can be potentially dangerous to us. So, but the reality is, is that almost all snake species are 100% harmless to people. I'm gonna repeat that. Almost all snake species are 100% harmless to people. So keep that in mind when you see a snake and your knee jerk reaction is to bash it on the head with a shovel. You know, that is just not a cool thing to do. It's almost never necessary, even if there is a venomous species of snake. So most snakes are just out there trying to live their life. Frankly, I know it's hard to believe, but they are more afraid of us than we are of them. In most cases for our native snakes in North America, where, uh, which we have, um, how many snakes do we have? I think we've got about 50 species of snakes um, in the US. There's a few thousand, maybe 3,500 species of snakes in the world. But most of those snakes are way smaller than us and they are afraid of us. And so I think some of the reasons beyond the potential, you know, venomous snakes that we might encounter that people are afraid of snakes is that they don't have eyelids. So take a look at this Eastern rat snake here, pretty much again, a harmless animal. I have been out on the trail and had to pick up wild rat snakes like this that were hanging over the trail and people were freaking out. They don't even really strike at you. You know, they're, they're just like super docile um, and they are out there feeding on rodents as the name would suggest. They also eat birds, but take a look at the eye. They don't have eyelids. That's just how snakes evolved. And so I think that's a little bit creepy. It's like that kind of staring eye that is unsettling to human beings because we're visual creatures and we're mammals that are social. And in most social mammals, a direct stare is actually a sign of, of a threat or aggression. And so we look at snakes and they have that big eye just staring at us. And I think it just, again, naturally innately puts us on edge, but it's just how snakes are made. It's not gonna hurt you. Um, so most snakes, their tactic to avoid you is either to sit really still and not move and hope that you don't see them or to flee, right? They don't want anything to do with us. So most often, if you encounter a snake, just give it its distance and walk away from it and there'll be no trouble whatsoever. So this is a rat snake, one of our most common species. This is the Eastern uh, rat snake, used to be called the black rat snake. There's a bunch of different rat snakes. They're all really cool. Down South, there's the yellow rat snake and the gray rat snake. Um, there's different subspecies of the black rat snake, the corn snake, um, really, really cool snakes. And, and one that you're frankly likely to encounter at some point if you go outside. Even more common is this kind of snake. This is a garter snake. Now, again, there are several species of garter snakes that collectively live pretty much all across the US. And um, this picture also shows something that I think freaks a lot of people out. It's that forked tongue. 
Some people think, well, that's like a stinger. It's going to sting me with that um, or give me its venom or something like that. And no, all the snake is doing with that tongue is smelling. So I want everybody to put the to your tongue on the roof of your mouth. Okay, everyone doing that? Now imagine what is right above the roof of your mouth, right above your tongue. It's your nasal passage, right? So our sense of smell and taste are connected and it helps it, I, I share that to help you kind of conceptualize what's going on inside a snake's mouth. So they flick their tongue out and those two forks just gather scent particles and they bring it back in and they actually, their scent organ is in the roof of their mouth, just below where ours would be. And they're able to perceive scents just by flicking their tongue out. So that's all that's happening there. Again, it's completely harmless. It's not gonna hurt you with its tongue whatsoever. Garter snakes are really cool too because most snakes lay eggs because they're reptiles, but I think about, it's roughly about 30% of snake species, usually Northern species, that um, whose eggs might not be able to develop and hatch before the winter, um, they actually give live birth and garter snakes are one of them. So at this time of year, especially if you live in the northern half of the country, you might actually be spotting baby garter snakes at this time of year if you're out doing fall cleanup in your yard and that kind of thing. Let them be. They're really, really beneficial. They're eating insects and worms and slugs. And as they get bigger, they start to eat things like fish and frogs, but completely harmless to people. This is a cousin of the garter snake, the ribbon snake. And you can see here, it's gobbling up a frog. Um, frogs are cute, but you know these are not snakes that are coming after people. We're not like their prey. They want nothing to do with us. They really just wanna be left alone. Some species of snakes even eat their venomous cousins. Now, again, not all species of snakes are venomous. The minority of snakes are actually venomous. And so right here, we have a king snake feeding on a copperhead. So in addition to helping keep pests under control, helping keep rodent populations under control for being food for lots of other animals higher up on the food chain, because a lot of other things eat snakes, some snake species are actually helping to keep their po the populations of their venomous cousins under control so that we're less likely to encounter them. And so one of the rules of thumb in practicing the golden rule of respecting wildlife and not approaching it or trying to pick it up or touch it is to learn about what species you have around you. So you can identify which are the potentially dangerous ones, like I was saying earlier with the spiders. So this is a basic rule of thumb for the venomous snakes that we have here in North America. Most of them are kind of pit vipers. So they've got the vertical pupil like a cat. They've got a little pit that helps them sense heat because they eat warm blooded animals like birds and mammals. Um, and they tend to have the triangular shaped head. Whereas our non-venomous species, they have a round pupil, they don't have the pit in their, um, in, their, in, their, in their face, the heat sensing pit, and they tend to have a more narrow shaped head. Now, of course, like with all rules, there's always an exception. So that doesn't apply to everyone, but it does apply to things like copperheads, which is the top left image there, um, like co to cotton mouths, which you can see why they got their name with their white mouth, water moccasin and cotton mouth are the same thing, or also to our rattlesnake species, which we have several across North America. Now, rattlesnakes are interesting too. I was mentioning before that most snake species, they're going to try to flee or hide from you. So with copperheads, they try to hide. They will sit so still in the dead leaves out in the woods and hope that you just don't see them. And they're not going to aggressively strike out at you unless you get right on top of them. And yes, sometimes accidents do happen because they are pretty good at camouflage. But, um, you know, with a rattlesnake, I mean, these animals are terrified of you and they are going to warn you when you get too close to them because they're afraid they're going to rattle. And in fact, a lot of non-venomous snakes will have also evolved to rattle their tails in the leaf litter which sounds kind of like a rattlesnake's rattle. Um, so I just want to emphasize that. Yes, snakes are, can be scary. I'll give you that. And some of them can be dangerous, like these species that we have on the screen here. But if you do a little bit of education of yourself, learn what species are found in your area or where you're going on vacation or hiking, and just practice awareness when you're out in nature, you know, almost never are you going to be in a dangerous situation with these animals. And even if you do get a little bit too close, usually they'll, they'll warn you. So this is the exception to the, the rules that I was just talking about a minute ago. This is a coral snake. 
a venomous species. We've got a few different coral snake species in North America. And obviously they don't have the triangular shaped head. They're not pit vipers. So they don't have the heat sensing pit in their face. And um, so, you know, like I said, there always is an exception, but here's the, the, the little rhyme that, uh, you know, the old folk, folk rhyme to help identify the coral snake from the non-venomous king snake, which kind of has a mimicking color going on. So if you can read it on the screen here, but what it boils down to is that in coral snakes, the red and the yellow are touching. And in king snakes, the yellow is surrounded by bands of black. So the red and yellow never touch. And also in coral snakes, the front of their head is black or dark. So in the king snakes, it's not. So that's one little tip. If you happen to encounter one of these brightly colored striped snakes, that might help you identify which one it is. But even if it's a non-venomous king snake, you should still give it its space. Don't get close to it. Don't try to touch it um, unless you are just 100% certain you know what you're doing. But I, even then, I would advise only you know, ever, like I was saying, in an instance where the animal's in danger, try to move it. And if you're not sure, let nature take its course and don't get close to it. And I just threw this in here because I think it's cute. Even though they don't have those, those, you know, eyelids that blink, I think snakes can be cute too and endearing in their own way. So I'm hoping that you will try to turn around the old um, sort of standby of the only good snake is a dead snake, because frankly, that's kind of an ignorant thing to say. Um, you know, it just is. Snakes are important wildlife. They provide really important ecosystem services that benefit people, and most of them are totally harmless. And our fear response to them has caused us to aggressively wipe out snake species. And it's just, you know, it's unfortunate and it's unnecessary. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll as a society, use knowledge and a little bit of the kind of information I'm sharing today to help us get over that so we can stop those bad behaviors. All right, last animal, one of my favorites, not really associated with Halloween, but a lot of people are freaked out by them. And they're so cool, so cool. So it's the opossum, the Virginia opossum. You can shorten it to possum, most of us do. Um, so these are animals that are super unique here in North America. They are marsupials. Now marsupials are mammals, but unlike placental mammals, which is what we, the group of mammals we belong to and most of the mammals on the planet belong to, instead of developing inside of our mother and getting nutrients through the placenta, marsupials evolved a little bit differently. They give birth to extremely tiny, you know, what we would call premature babies that are almost not developed at all. And the baby then crawls into a pouch that the mother has inside of which are her, her nipples that she will then nurse the babies from. And they will continue their development inside that pouch. So it's just a different mode of giving birth and, and, and raising babies. Possums are the only marsupial found in North America. Interestingly, I was actually just reading up and I'm listening to a really neat podcast about marsupial evolution. That's what you do when you're a naturalist and a nerd. But um, at any rate, I didn't know this, that marsupials actually first evolved in the Northern Hemisphere and migrated over the course of you know, millennia down um, into the Southern Hemisphere and most notably South America. And then from there went across Antarctica when there, the land was connected into Australia. And today, again, millennia later, Australia really is where the majority of marsupial species are found. And they have diversified greatly there. So everything from kangaroos to koalas, to Tasmanian devils to wombats, these are all different kinds of marsupials. But the other place where there's a lot of marsupials is South America, and most of them are opossums. So in Australia, you have possums, which are marsupials, but a different kind. And in the New World, in South America, and with the Virginia opossum in North America, we call them opossums. So they're related, but kind of separately related. So anyway, possums are unique in that they are the only marsupial mammal found in North America. Here's a picture of a baby possum. And this is actually fairly well developed after it's, it's gotten into the pouch because when they're born, they don't even have formed, they have not formed even their hind legs yet. So they really are, you know, basically just embryos but they develop their front arms really, really rapidly compared to other kinds of mammals. So they can crawl up after birth 
into the mother's pouch so that they can nurse and continue to grow. And baby possums are cute. And the moms are really good moms. You know, they sometimes have as many as 13 babies. It's pretty phenomenal. And when the babies get big enough to leave the pouch, they ride around on mom's back. I mean, it doesn't get more heartwarming than that, at least not to me. Um, these are not rodents. So I talked about how they're marsupials. They're not big rats. That's what you hear people saying, not true. Yes, they have hairless tails and they have gray fur. That's pretty much as close to a rat that you're gonna get. And um, just a completely different group of animals. So if you ever hear anybody say that, you now know that you can correct them and tell them that they're marsupials and a special marsupial because they're the only one found in North America. Another shot of a cute little baby possum, right? Who couldn't love that? And one more, just because I'm a sucker for possums. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, this is a big mature adult, you know, quite a, a, a chunky one. Um, and these are animals that you want around. Not only are they cute, but like all of the other animals that I've talked about today, they play a really important role in the ecosystem. So number one, possums are omnivores. So they are kind of out there eating whatever is available. So they do eat a lot of you know, berries and fruits and things like that, but they're out there eating things like slugs and rodents and they eat snakes. So you know, not that snakes are bad or rodents are bad, at least wild native ones, but the possums are there providing a check on the population of those other animals. So without them, they could actually you know, those other animals might grow in population and then actually do become potentially problematic. So possums are out there cleaning up our environment and helping to keep potential pests or dangerous species under control. And by the way, they do feed on venomous species of snakes. And they are, they have sort of a, a tolerance for snake venom. So they can get bitten by something like a copperhead or even a rattlesnake, and it won't necessarily kill them. It might slow them down a little bit, but they'll just continue going through and munch on that snake and get up and be able to move on later and you know, continue their opossum business. Um, they also provide another really critical ecosystem service that we only learned about just a few years ago from a study that looked at different North American mammal species and their grooming habits. And the reason they were looking at that was they were trying to figure out what impact that these woodland mammals might have on tick populations. Ticks are arachnids related to spiders, and they actually can spread some pretty bad diseases to human beings. And so they were trying to you know, determine, are, do any of these species, raccoons, foxes, skunks, you know, are they having any impact on tick populations, either by controlling them or spreading them? Well, they found out that, again, even though they might be kind of ugly and they're that kind of you know, sort of disheveled gray fur, um, possums are really, fastidiously clean animals. So if you've ever seen a cat grooming itself, possums do the same thing. And they're so good at it that they will actually pick off any ticks that might have gotten on them, either crawling around in their fur or maybe even bitten on them. And of course they eat them. It's a nice little protein snack for the possum. But it's been estimated that one individual possum can take out 5,000 ticks from its, its habitat area, which is the space of your neighborhood, in just like one, one season, one summer. So that's pretty powerful. And it's a pretty powerful reason that you might want them around. So they are kind of impervious to venomous snakes and they will eat them. They eat ticks and keep their populations down. Another really neat thing about possums is that they don't get rabies. Almost all mammals can contract rabies, but possums for whatever reason, it might be due to their slightly lower body temperature. I don't think we really fully understand exactly what's going on with it, but they just generally don't get rabies. So um, it's just another neat fact about them that most people don't know, and that makes them pretty cool animals. Now, I know showing this picture might erase all of the goodwill that I had just built up with possums because it looks kind of scary, but I share it because another unique thing about possums is that they have more teeth than any other mammal in North America. They've actually got 50 teeth, and that's something that just goes along with being a marsupial. Marsupials tend to have more sets of teeth than other groups of mammals. And they're using those teeth not to attack people, but again, to eat snakes and rats and mice and slugs. And even though they can bite, anything with a mouth can bite, possums rarely ever bite people, even if you get close to them. Instead, if they can't flee, normally what they do is they play possum. That means that they kind of play dead and they will just kind of flop over, their eyes will roll back, 
they'll kind of drool, they'll emit a stinky smell, and usually that's enough to drive a potential predator away. So even though they have those mouth, that mouthful of sharp teeth, it's not something that they typically will use against human beings. So with that said, I leave you with this majestic opossum. Um, and the message that for all of these animals, whether they're bees and wasps or snakes or spiders um, or bats, that even though some of these animals, you know, they can be potentially dangerous to people, they might bite or sting us, they almost never do, especially when we respect them and give them their space. And if we see them, to enjoy it as a wonderful wildlife encounter but not to run panicking, not to stay indoors, and certainly not to get out you know, the shovel or the machete or the bug spray and kill them. We can coexist with these animals if we just give them space. And remember, kids learn from us. Children don't, are not born, as a general rule of thumb, afraid of these kinds of animals, at least not any more afraid of them than any other kind of animal. They learn their fear of these animals from us, and they learn statements like the only good snake is a dead snake from us. So let's change that. Let's be adults who teach the next generation that all animals are important and they share our space with us and they belong and that we can coexist with them if we're just a little bit aware of them and their natural adaptations and their habitats and we respect it and give them their space. So I've got a little bit long, so I'm just gonna skip through these last couple slides. Uh, basically, I was just encouraging you to check out our Garden for Wildlife program, where you can actually support a lot of these species right in your own yard or garden. So just go to nwf.org slash garden. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. If you're onto social media, you can check out shopnwf.org where you can pick up things like bat houses. And um, we've got these really great nature apps, field guides online that you can carry with you that will help you identify the species that you see when you're out in nature. And of course, shameless plug for my book, Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife. This will teach you not only how to create a garden to attract and support a lot of these different kinds of wildlife species, not venomous snakes, we'll leave those guys out, but also how to avoid conflict with them right in your own backyard, garden, or neighborhood. So with that said, shoot your questions into the Q&A. Um, I think we might have time for you know, one or two questions. So I am going to open up my Q&A here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take two questions. If we, again, don't get to your question right now, we will do our best to follow up with you via email with an answer to it. So, um, Let's see, do most bees die if they sting or another myth from childhood? Um, honeybees certainly will die if they sting you. Um, that's because when they, their stingers have a barb on it. And as I mentioned, the stinger is the modified ovipositor. So it's actually attached to the internal organs. And so when that honeybee stings you, the stinger actually stays in you and rips from the bee's body and actually will kill it. I don't actually know if that's true for some of our wild native bees that are solitary, but you've given me a good little research question to, to look up and see if I could figure that out. Um, so let's see. Um, all right, let me, I'll take one more question. If I put up a bat box, this is from Karen, um, and she says, if I put up a bat box, what can I do to help encourage bats to find it and move in? And do different bats need different types of bat boxes? This is the subject of an entire other presentation, but very quickly, there's no guarantee a bat box will work. We're not bats. So even if we follow all of the best practices, sometimes they're, they're hung in such a way or they're built in such a way that it just makes bats say, I don't wanna move in there. But here are some of the best practices to increase your chances of getting bats to move into a bat house. Number one, I was mentioning earlier that most bat species can't really take off from the ground. So therefore they don't really like shelter areas that are too close to the ground because they're afraid it puts them too close to predators. So if you put up a bat house, you wanna hang it high, either on a pole or on the side of a building, at least 12 feet, 15 feet or higher is even better off of the ground. You never wanna hang it in a tree, even though bats naturally roost in trees, they tend to almost never use a bat house that's hung in a tree, again, probably because they don't feel secure, that it's too conspicuous to potential predators like snakes or owls or raccoons or things like that. So you wanna mount it high, it needs to be big. So at least two feet tall, 
by at least 18 to 20 inches wide with multiple chambers. You're going to be much more likely to attract a bat colony with that kind of bat house. Now you can put up a smaller one. We call them bachelor houses because usually it's individual male bats here and there that will hang out in them. But if you put up a bigger bat house, you might actually attract a maternal colony and you might get a whole bunch of female bats actually using it as a place to raise their young. Pretty neat. Otherwise, definitely you don't want to be spraying insecticides because most of our bats eat insects. So if you're nuking your entire neighborhood or yard and there are no insects, they're not going to come. And bats do tend to like to be around a water source. So you'll have better luck if there's a local stream or pond nearby. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you might that you won't attract them. It just means that they're uh, maybe a little bit more likely if you are in those areas. So with that said, I think we're out of time. So I want to thank you again for everything that you've done to help support our work at the National Wildlife Federation. You know, we can't do our work without supporters like you. There's only so many of us that actually work at the Federation and you help us take these messages of wildlife conservation and actual programs and work on the ground that is making a difference for our wildlife here in America and, and all around the world. So big, big, big thank you and appreciation for your support. So be on the lookout for our next all access. Um, we'll share that information with you guys um, via email. We'll send you, um, you know, we'll send you communications about that. And as I mentioned a couple times already, shoot us um, any further questions that you might have via email. We will be saving this and we'll be sharing the presentation later if you want to revisit it. And we will have all your questions. So be on the lookout for emails in the coming days or you know, give us a week or two and I'll do my best to get back to you on all of your unanswered questions. So with that, I'm going to sign off. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>